Okay, welcome to session four, guys, which is the, we're going to be focusing on hydrogeological drilling, construction, and uh, development, you know, getting your boreholes in the ground and developed. Uh, just a quick outline, we'll go through the objectives again, and then I just want to talk to you guys about the Groundwater Project, which is quite a cool website I think all of you should check out. And we'll go through the schedule. Yeah, I just want to chat about the schedule at the end of the presentation, just to to figure out if everybody's happy with the pace we're going at, or if you want to go quicker or slower. And today we're going to be doing the borehole installation component of the groundwater resource development process. Um, so we'll go through drilling method selection, what you need to do with during drilling supervision and then your construction design, basic principles, basic um, decisions that you have to make, and then borehole development. At the end, we'll do questions like we always do. So again, the objectives of what I'm trying to do with this mentorship program is just to give junior guys like yourselves the uh, background and basic training so that when you do eventually get an opportunity you you have a, a strong platform and a strong base to go forward from um, just because the opportunities at the moment are quite limited for for young people and even experienced people in the industry then the groundwater project is something fairly new you know that i've uh, come across it started by the IAH, International Association for Hydrogeologists. And uh, what they're doing here is they providing textbooks and papers and you know, educational material about groundwater for people to, to access free of charge through their website. You know, one of the first books that they've put up is Freeze and Cherries Groundwater, which is quite a sort of seminal book in terms of groundwater studies. Yeah, you know, that's up on their website at the moment, and they they're looking to add about a hundred books over the next year, or by the end of this year, actually. So check them out, uh, follow them on LinkedIn, and uh, have a look at their website and register. Yeah, you know, they are looking for people to help with translations into different languages. So maybe you know to help translate into Afrikaans or one of the you know, Zulu, Pedi, one of the a African languages might be helpful to the project overall. Um, so just have a look at that, that website when you get a minute. It's free of charge to, to register and get involved. In the schedule, you know, to, tomorrow we're doing the basic training on the aquifer testing, your types of aquifer test and the data interpretation. Then next week, uh, my field work has been pushed out to the first week of August. So I want to do on Thursday, the groundwater characterization session. And then in mid August, go through groundwater modeling in a bit and sort of cover the groundwater modeling process and the models that we typically encounter in consulting. Um, if anybody has any comments about the schedule, if you want stuff to happen later or sooner, you know, just let me know either in the chat or at the end of the session, we can chat about it a bit. And we'll get straight into the drilling. Yeah, this, uh, it's quite a difficult presentation to compile because drilling is a very practical thing. Um, so I can talk about the theory. There's so many different things this presentation could have gone on for hours and hours because there's so many pictures and so many different types of drilling uh, methods out there. And, you know, so I'll try to keep it as simple as possible. Uh, we'll start with the drilling method selection. I've just ch chosen the sort of common methods that we're encountering in uh, South Africa and in the consulting industry. Yeah, drilling ranges from your hand tools, which is just a pick and a shovel to get your hand dug wells, all the way up to your high speed mechanical drills, such as a sonic drill or even a percussion drill rig like we've got here. Um, and the common ones that we, we work with in South Africa is your cable tool drilling or a stump wood. You know, the farmers still use this sometimes. 
I've never personally seen a stump word in action. And then reverse circulation, which we use typically in exploration for your infill drilling, you know, your mineral exploration, not groundwater. Uh, it's infill drilling. And then air percussion or DTH, which is the one that we use the most for groundwater. And then rotary mud drilling, which we use in specific um, circumstances, you know, with unconsolidated sediments and sand, typically. So with a cable tool, you've got um, your balls drilled just by raising and dropping a string of a string of steel drilling tools, sort of up and down, and um, this crushes the rock by the impact of the drilling bit. So it's literally you raise a, a weight and you drop it, and it pushes your drill bit into the ground. And your casing is installed as you're drilling. As you're going along, you're putting your casing in. And it's a slow method, but it does do quite large diameters and it's quite good for the lower yielding aquifer units. And your initial setup costs and getting the rig out is quite low because it's a, it's a cheap method. There's very little, you know, you don't have hydraulics. There's not that many moving parts on the rig, but because it can take weeks, months to drill a hole, your labor costs can become expensive. So that's something to consider. If you want to drill a 100 meter hole or a 200 meter hole in, in hard rock, this is not the method to go for. And then your air percussion, your DTH, this is one that we use the most in groundwater. Yeah, your compressed air is fed through the drill rod to a hammer and a bit. So this is what the bit looks like. You, got, you see these little holes here, the air comes out through this and it's rotating yeah. Uh, you know, I'm busy using my hands. I know you can't see them, but the bit rotates and the, these tungsten balls grind up against the rock and the air blows up whatever they're grinding off. And then there's a hammer. The sleeve moves up and down, hammering on top as it's rotating and crushing. This hammer pushes it down. So then it blows all your drill chips up and around the outside of the rod. Yeah, he has another hammer and uh, there's the hammer, the bit and then there's the hammer there and there's a big hammer over there with a stabilizer on top of it. The stabilizer we had to use because we were drilling, I think it was an 18 inch hole or a 22 inch hole. So to keep the rods going straight down the hole, you put on these big stabilizers. And your chips get lifted on the outside of the drilling rod. So it comes out and hits the table and makes a big pile of chips around the outside. So that's the basics of air percussion. Is everybody comfortable with your air percussion? How it works? Yes. Okay. And th this one, it, it's very good for groundwater drilling because you'll see when we go through the other ones, this gives you the best idea of what the water is because you're blowing the, the chips out. If you hit a water strike, you blow almost all of the water out with your chips. You know, with the cable drilling, you, you're removing your chips manually with a baler system. Um, and then you'll see with the reverse circulation and the mud rotary, you're losing your your blow yield information, which is arguably one of the most important things you get during the drilling process. So RC, um, you use your, it's a similar process to the, the DTH. You've got a percussion hammer, but you have a double wall rod. So your air feeds through the outer pipe and then your drill chips are returned up through the inner pipe up to surface and it comes out like a, you know, we call it a cyclone. It looks like a big uh, cement mixer. These guys have just got to open one. I didn't have a picture, unfortunately. But uh, the advantage with the RC rig is that you get a, almost 100% of your chips are recovered. That's why they use it in mineral exploration to do infill drilling. It's a lot cheaper than percussion drilling or diamond core drilling. Uh, but this 
your cyclone, my experience is that the cyclone can only allow so much water to flow through it. So your blow yields typically stopped, like where we were drilling, they stopped at five liters a second. Even though the hole was stronger, you couldn't physically get more than five liters a second through the cyclone. It was just getting stuck in there and, and flooding the cyclone. So it's not an ideal one for groundwater boreholes, although it is quick. So you can see here, you've got your outer rod where you push your air down, goes onto your percussion bits, percussion hammer. And then this feeds into the inner pipe. It goes up and through your cyclone where you put it in bags or you just make a pile of cuttings. Both DTH and reverse circulation have a compressor associated with them. You know, your compressors range from a 7 bar up to 20, 30 bar, um, depending on how deep you're drilling. The deeper you're drilling, the more air you need to lift your chips. Um, and also the wider the diameter. Because as soon as you get air loss with these um, methods, you know, if you're drilling in cast, and you hit a, a cave or a system like that and you get air loss obviously you can't feed your hammer the hammer stops hammering and um, the air just goes straight into this hole so that that's a risk with the, these methods with the air compressor and just to go back to dth what we use sometimes is a method called odex or symmetrics where you drill your casing in at the same time as you're drilling down. Uh, I've personally not had experience with this. You know, we usually get away with just doing pure DTH, but you get a special bit where you clip the casing onto the bit. And as you're driving down, you installing your casing. You know, that's where, what they drill with in like Namibia or Botswana, where you got the big Kalahari sands on top of uh, hard rock. So just so that you're aware of that. And when you can't do ODEX, you know, where it's, it's going to be too expensive or the formation is, you know, what, what we've seen in like the DRC is you'll get weathered rock, then you'll get a hard rock, then you'll get weathered rock again, then hard rock. So it goes hard, soft, hard, soft. And what happens with the ODEX is as you go through the soft into the hard, it snaps the bit where your casing is attached to. So your casing just sort of gets stuck in the hole and then you have to pull everything out and start again. So in those formations, you'll use rotary mud drilling where you've got a hollow rotating bit where you've got a mixture of, it's called drilling mud. It's a mixture of clay and water or chemicals that you force through the, the bit and then that lifts your drill chips with the mud through the rods up to the surface. So you get like a slurry of chips. You can see it just sort of grinds away. You don't get chips as such. You just get like a powder that's mixed with this mud and slurry. Um, and the mud at the same time, you know, is lifting everything up with it. It also forms like a, a layer on your walls. So it, it almost acts like a casing in your borehole. You, know, you think about clay. If you take clay and you put it against the wall, it forms like a film and it gets hard. That's what the drilling mud does as well. That's why it's good for sandy formations. But it's not good for your hydrogeological data because you're adding water to your borehole. So you're never going to be sure, is this mud coming up or is it a blow yield? Is it a water strike? Um, you know, that's, you've got to sort of wait till the end of drilling and then see if there's water in your borehole. You can't see live blow yields and water strikes when you're doing a rotary mud hole. So it's, if you can avoid it, avoid it. So I went through that very quickly, but is everybody sort of comfortable with the main three, sort of three or four that we use in groundwater exploration drilling methods. Yes. 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 Okay. Great. So no questions on the, the drilling method itself.
nothing. So I'm going to carry on to hydrogeological drilling supervision, which is sort of where um, our job starts. You know, drilling is done by a contractor. We, our main job is the drilling supervision and the construction design. So when part of our responsibility for drilling supervision is to conduct our pre-setup drilling rig checklist, just to make sure the drill rig is safe, the site is safe, and the driller knows what's going on. He's compliant with our client safety requirements and he, he looks like he's gonna be able to do the job. He's got the right equipment, he's got the right casing on site, you know, those kind of checks. And then during the drilling, we do daily site diaries where we record meterage drilled, uh, the, the diameter of the, the drilling, diameter of casing installed, screens installed, a geological log of the borehole, water strike depths and the blow yields per water strike, and then the final blow yield of the borehole. Those are the big five that we have to get. I'll go through the different forms that uh, I use at Alicanto. You know, every company might have a different form, but these are the ones that I use. And here's the drilling rig inspection sheet. So you fill in just your admin section of the sheet. You've got the contractor name, your name, project name, number of the rig. Sometimes you'll be running multiple rigs on a project. In site location, signature, signature. So signature of the drilling contractor, signature of you, the project number, the date, and then the number of employees on site. Do they have three people, six people? You know, how many people are there? And then you go through your drill site location. You've got your condition and is it compliant or not? And then you've got comments. But sometimes you'll have something like uh, if you're doing a single borehole, you don't need to put an outhouse on the site because it's one day they can go to the main offices or whatever. Um, you know, so you'll say no, but you'll say comment not required. PPE signage at the site entrance. Yeah, you know, what I make the drillers do just to avoid little kids and um, you know passers by coming too close to the drill rig, I uh, make them put up a, a barrier fence, and then they've got their safety PPE requirements at the entrance to the site, which is controlled usually by us, the consultant, or one of their guys that isn't too busy. So you got your signage there, and then you've got your emergency contact numbers here. This is just because you've got drill chips, you can see them sort of coming out the hole here. Those are little pieces of stone. And if you get a little kid that's curious and he gets too close and it gets him in the eye, you know, you, you're gonna get a lot of trouble. And I mean, the poor little guy's probably gonna have a, have a bad time. And you've got your smoking areas, no parking within 20 meters of the rig. Again, the no parking is because of the chips. Uh, our tasks have gone through. Hard hats and safety glasses, that's important because you've got this derrick, the mast, you know, that's a height. So hard hat is very important. Glasses for the chips. General housekeeping. This is an example of decent housekeeping. You've got your casing ready to be installed in one pile. Then you've got your development pipes and your sort of backup casing or your next holes casing in another pile. And then the, the camp is behind, it's out of the way, it's away from the draw rig. Your visitor tracking system, we usually do that in the daily diaries. The warning signs, you know, they've got the PPE signage at the entrance, but is it dirty, is it caked in dust, is it caked in mud? Because then it's not very useful. Um, and then you've got to ground your rig base in the derrick mast. Yeah, if they don't have grounding cables, what you have to do is as soon as there's clouds or a storm, you pull the rig down, you stop them from drilling and you, you wait for it to pass. Because if you get hit by lightning on that rig, it's, uh, it's not great. <laughs> and then this is just expansion on the housekeeping again. 
They've got the drilling rods on a carousel so that they're not lying around everywhere. Your compressor pipe is nicely on the other side, away from everybody. And then, of course, we've got bad housekeeping. We've got drill casing lying everywhere. You know, the drill rods are lying over here. I actually got hit in the head with this rod uh, when they were raising it because the way they raise it is they've got this cable that runs up the mast. So if you're not watching carefully or if they don't give you a warning, they just pull it up and it swats whatever it can get hold of. And here's our driller walking away on his cell phone. So this is bad housekeeping. You know, there's no uh, boundary fences, nothing on this site. Okay, general safety. You look at your first aid person, which most companies should have. Daily toolbox talk for the contractor. Suitable clothing. You don't want any loose clothing. Because you've got turning rods and you've got turning um, machinery, any loose clothing that can get pulled in there. Safety shoes are very important. Reflective vests, hard hat safety glasses, fall protection. You know, it's usually good to have one harness on site just in case someone needs to climb on top of the rig to do some welding or repairs because the rigs can get as high as probably about three meters, four meters. Emergency phone numbers on a sign by somewhere. That's usually it, it'll be your number as the managing consultant, um, the, the drilling foreman's number, and then the, the sort of main safety officer for your client or for the site just so in case something happens someone can just pick up the phone and, and get through then your contractor should have an emergency response plan that everybody's familiar with that is what happens if this happens you know it's uh, if the rig explodes where do you run to if this spills what do you do uh, it's just a one or two pager just going through your your typical scenarios and then job safety analysis per task so that would be your safety analysis of raising the derrick uh, grounding the rig drilling every step of the process you just got to go through it and make sure that they're aware of the risks and um, have they got a plan in place for these risks to manage it properly and ensure that nobody gets hurt on the job The drilling equipment itself, are all the moving parts guarded? You know, do they have grids over the, the pulleys and the, the motors? Because you'll be surprised a lot of drillers don't. They'll just have a fan belt unguarded. You know, you can stick your hand in it any time, no problem. Generators at least 15 meters away from the rig. That's just in case the, the generator explodes. Yeah, I'll put that in because I've had experience with a generator with a cracked fuel tank catching on fire right next to the drill rig. So that's why I make them do that. And cover panels on the electric boxes must be put on. You know, a lot of the time they have them, but they don't want to put it on. Same as a high voltage sign, it's there, but it's just not put up. Air compressors guarded, and then your piping is secured sufficiently. That's to make sure your pipes don't roll around the site. And if you're doing 24-hour drilling, which we don't typically do, you know, but if you are doing 24 hours, you need to make sure there's adequate lighting to make sure people don't trip over stuff, they don't get hit in the head with things. Just your basics. Fire extinguishers, signage at the fuel storage. End of the drill, rod, drill rods must be properly chopped. That's just to avoid any gunk getting inside the rod. You know, any mud, any, um, you know, any rodents or insects or whatever, something that can block, block the rod when they, they put it up. Uh, you know, I've heard stories about mice and rats getting into the drill rods when they're not secured properly and then turn the rod up and it just blocks. And it pops your hydraulics on the, the, the headgear of the, <laughs> of the rig. And the drill rods are level, again, so that they don't roll away and run over someone's foot. And general housekeeping in your drilling equipment area. And finally, you check your materials. 
you look at your solid casing, are the threads or the welding end of the, the casing clean? You look at it there, is it clean enough? Is it the right um, wall thickness? Yeah, are your slotted casings, are they clear and open? Yeah, you look at this casing here, that thing, I don't know what happened there. Nobody knew what happened to this casing, but you're not going to use it. But you can see your slots are okay on the other casings. And then here on the PVC casing, you can see your slots are, are open. You know, what happens with the PVC is when they machine cutting it, sometimes the machine doesn't go all the way through. So you'll have like a surface slot, but it won't go all the way through. So you have to be very careful with the, the, um, the PVC casings. You know, on the steel casing, they generally, when they machine cut, they go all the way through. But sometimes if it's a cheap brand of PVC casing, it'll cut five millimeters, not the full six millimeters through the wall. So just have a look at it. Just visually walk up and down your casing. Get the driller just to take a cloth and a bucket of water just to wipe it off and get rid of any mud that might be on it from offloading. Um, because if you put in a casing that hasn't been cut properly, you lose that section. You might even close off a water strike in your borehole. The storage area must be clean for your casing just to avoid mud accumulating again. Uh, gravel pack, you want it to be clear from fines. So you see here, they brought this gravel pack for me. Um, just uh, got a tin tab or scale there. So the size of the gravel was fine, but you had this sort of clay, uh, almost like cement in it. And what would happen if we put that down the hole is that that would form like a, a cement and it would bridge the slots. So we couldn't use that. The driller had to go back and uh, sieve all of that stuff manually by hand and but if you don't check these things you chuck it down the borehole and then you wonder why your pumps are burning out so just always be sure that you check that and then here again you can see my boundary fence is up and they put the trees that we knocked down nicely to make another boundary fence there Here's all of my drill chips that I was logging, drill rods, and then casing. So this is not perfect. And there's the drill, the generator that caught fire. Yeah, that's where the 15 meter rule came from. But in general, this is pretty decent housekeeping for a, for a drill site. So is everybody comfortable with a pre-drill checklist? A lot of safety stuff, but some practical things just to, to think about. Um, yeah, I am like comfortable and stuff, but like I have just like one question, right? If it happens that, okay, like for example, the safety part of the drilling, is it like mandatory for you like as a geohydrologist to take care of that? Like, is it part of, what I'm supposed to do because I'm wondering if let's say like one time I have to like be part um uh supervise like a drilling session right and then there's there's like a I don't know a Yago who's been in the industry for like 35 years and then be like no 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 you don't need all of this everything is safe and stuff like do I have to insist on it or like What's the, what, what happens when that happens? Like when there's no like signs or boundary fences and stuff in a drilling like session? Mm -hmm. Well, look, I mean, you are typically the, the client's representative on site. So mm. the client appoints you to represent them during the drilling process. And uh, most clients, you know, your minds and your, um, most people have safety protocols, safety um, sort of check departments mm. and you have to make sure that it's safe because even in 30 years you know what happens on a drill site the, these are big machines these are and it doesn't matter if the driller has never been hurt you know, mm. you're looking out for other people you're looking out for yourself you're looking out for the community that might be um, around your site so you you do have to sort of swing your weight around and say listen that's not how you work on my site 
Um, I, I've had drillers argue with me. I mean, I had a guy in Tanzania, he rocked up with shorts and flip-flops yeah. uh, to drill on a barrack mine. <laughs> yeah. I've, I've seen it. Mm. Okay. So you just have to insist on it. Like, doesn't matter. That's the thing. Um, you know, you tell them, listen, you work for me. If you want to go do it on your own, go do it on your own and pay yourself. But uh, I pay the bills and you will do it my way. Because what's going to happen is if he gets hurt, he's going to say, no, workman's comp. Mm. Um, this guy wasn't looking out for me. He should have told me. And look, he had the papers. He didn't fill it in. Um, so, look, put, put your foot down because accidents do happen and they, they don't happen slowly. That's true. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Then Poncho, you put your hand up there. Uh, okay, thank you. Um, I just wanted to ask regarding um, when you said, uh, let's say you are going to drill one borehole somewhere in Lichtenberg, ne? Mm -hmm. and then it was typically about like four to six hours. That's mm -hmm. because you've done all the the studies and stuff, and then storm comes, and then you had to stop. Um, mm -hmm. What I wanted to find out is, let's say it overlaps to the following day, because you are um, who's going to carry the cost? Is it you or the client or because you have to pay the drilling guys and, and yesterday you talked about um, field rates, like typically mm -hmm. maybe you charge per hour. So who's going to carry those costs? Like it comes down to your contracting mechanism. Um, usually you'll have a clause that says standing time rates are 1.5 times normal rate if you cause the standing time or 0.5 the normal rate if I cause the standing time. So if I stop it for safety concerns, you know, like in my contracts, I write it in there, like we reserve the right to stop work if there's unsafe conditions. Okay. okay. Um, and then your driller will have a contract with you that also you need to negotiate and say, listen, if there's a storm, if there's lightning, I'm gonna stop you from drilling. Tell me what your rate is. You know, and then you put that in your contract with the client and say, if there's a storm, we will cover half of the rate and you'll cover the other half of the rate. Okay. So you okay. negotiate it and you make sure that there's a mechanism in place to, to recover it. Okay. Thank you. No problem. Anybody else with the pre-drilling checklist? Okay, I'm going to carry on to the daily diaries. Now, the daily site diary is sort of your tracking of how much has actually been drilled, who came to site, you know, who was doing the work, what they put down the hole. Because at the end of the day, a borehole is just a piece of steel sticking out the ground. You've got no idea how deep, if a driller says to you, I've drilled 200 meters. You know, you measure it with your dip meter and you say, no, but it's only 100. And you'll say, yeah, yeah, but it collapsed. You can't disprove anything. Um, so that's what the daily site diary. You sit there and you, you record all of these things. So again, you got the date, project name, project number, drilling contractor name, and then the borehole number. Very important so that you know where you are when you read it later. You record the depth drilled, the time that you started, the diameter that you drilled, and then from and to your meters. So from zero to two, I did eight inch. Then at nine o'clock, we did 6.5 inch from two meters to 100 meters. So you track it like that. Then you got your casing, your time, the diameter of the casing, and the casing length. This one, you'll start from the bottom because you install your casing upside down. Um, I'll get to you now, Rudzani. So yeah, you'll say if it's a 50 meter ball, you'll say solid casing from 50 to 48. And then 48 to 40 is slotted casing. And then during drilling, you'll record your water strikes. So your first water strike, it'll usually be seepage. So you'll say depth is 20 meters, the yield was less than 0.1 or seepage, and your cumulative yield, which is the total of what's coming out the hole, is seepage. 
And then two is at 30 meters. So your total yield goes up to 0.2, therefore that's 0.2 and so on. Okay, Rosani, you had a question? Uh, yes, thank you, Matthew. Um, what I wanted to ask is, um, how important is it that you you also record um, coordinates? Uh, because I know that for geological exploration, uh, those are very important. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, so you said something about the borehole number, and then I just remembered that, okay, if there is, if there are borehole numbers, then you might want to add the coordinates as well. It definitely. Um, you know, that, that's something you record on your drill log. Yeah, because your coordinates, you're doing a once-off. So you'll see in the, the drilling log template or the drilling log form, um, you'll have an X and a Y. You know, to do it every day at the site is a bit redundant. Yeah, you know, with the daily diary, because this is sort of like an active, this is almost like an attendance register. So we try to just include sort of minimal admin information, which is sort of your static information. And this is the the crux of this form, is how much did we draw, how much casing did we put in, and what's coming out of the hole in terms of water. Because this is what your driller is going to invoice you on. Does yes. it make sense? Yes, I understand. Yeah, no, it makes it makes sense. Thank you. Yeah, cool. Yes, Victor. Do you raise your hand, Victor? No. Okay. So uh, there we go. Yes, Victor. Oh no! Sorry, sorry, sorry. I I, I forgot to unmute myself. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to ask. <laughs> Uh, the the one for cumulative yield and the mm. actual yield itself. How? Wh what is what is the difference? Uh, and how do we actually measure the water strike? I mean, the, the the yield per each water strike on site. Well, unfortunately, there's no way to do it uh, per water strike. So, what you'll do is you'll do sort of a logical deduction. You'll have your seepage here at strike one and then at strike two you'll stop your drilling and you'll blow it a little bit to get the yield and then you'll measure your yield as 0.1 for example so then your total will be 0.1 and your water strike will be 0.1 then you'll go to water strike three where you'll stop after you see the increase in the volume coming out of the borehole you will see it and then you'll stop blow yield and it'll be 0.5. Your total blow yield will be 0.5. And you'll say, okay, it's 0.5. That one was 0.1. Therefore, this one must be 0.4. And so on and so forth. Oh, okay. So we are doing this after like the whole complete uh, drilling session. And then after the equipping, then that's where we do this. No, no, no. This is as you drill. So... As you drill this first one, you stop and you blow. And then you see when you're drilling, because you'll see the water coming out the hole during drilling, it'll increase. Yeah. Yeah, then you'll stop the driller, they'll lift the rod half a meter and they'll blow for five minutes. And you'll do a measurement. And then you'll see another one where it increases because you'll, it, it's difficult to explain because you'll sort of feel you'll get a feel for it after a couple of holes. You'll see that there's a burst of water up on the table. And you'll say, wait, you've hit something. Or you'll see the headgear start to rattle. And you'll say, you've hit something. Stop, do a blow yield. Let's see. Mm. Okay, and the drillers also, they'll tell you, no, wait, there's something here. Let's do a blow yield. Yeah. Okay. All right, thanks. Antonio, you've got a question? Yes. Uh, hmm. Do you hear me? Yeah, can okay. you hear you now? Uh, yeah. Uh, did you record the water levels at the 
start at the end to the, the shift or it's not um, necessary? Not, not when you're drilling. Um, because you're using compressed air typically, you know, you're lifting that water out completely. So you don't have a stable water level. You don't stop long enough to get a water level. Okay. Okay. Okay, so then if you've got any subcontractors on the site, which you very rarely do, you put their name, what they were doing, and then any notes. So that's if you had um, like a mechanic. If you had to come and do some work on the rig, you'll just record that. And then any visitors to the site, you'll put their name, the organization that they're representing, and then why they came to site. You know, this is to avoid your politicians. You know, what happens when you do charity projects? It, I've had this so many times. A politician will pop up on site and do photographs, and then the other politicians will get upset, and then, you know, <laughs> you, you end up in the middle because they say, why are you giving these guys free things and you're not giving us? And, you know, meanwhile, you've been contracted by someone completely different. But when you stop them and you say, listen, write down on a piece of paper what you want here, then you can show people it wasn't me, it was this guy. Yeah, he's making up stories here. So very important if you're drilling out in the out in the bundus. Then at the end of each day, the contractor puts their name, your foreman or your chief driller puts their name and they sign. You put your name and you sign. This is so that everybody at the end of the day, you say, okay, you've drilled 100 meters on this borehole. You agree to it, I agree to it. Do not invoice more than this. We will not pay you for less than this, but we won't pay you for more than this either. Because then everybody is transparent. Everybody knows exactly what's happening on site. And you avoid fights at the invoicing and payment stage. Okay, so that is the daily site diaries. Is everybody comfortable with this? Yes. 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 Great. So we'll go on to the borehole log, which is sort of the crux and the most important thing you do for a hydrogeological perspective. So every meter, you're gonna ask the driller to lay out a sample. They usually just grab it with a spade and they put it in a nice neat line and then you sit and you log each meter. You log a geology where possible. Yeah, because when you're doing percussion drilling, you don't get nice cores or anything. You get little chips of rock. And sometimes in a hard rock, you'll get just a powder. So, <laughs> It'll be gray sand, you know, but then you've got to use your intellect and your sort of knowledge of the site and you're going to describe it. You're going to say clayey, gray uh, material, most likely granite or most likely this. You're going to try and infer information from it. So write down as much as you can about the drill chips. Then you get the contractor or you can do it as well. You record your penetration rates, which is in minutes per meter. That's how fast your rods are going down the hole. So that gives you an indication of how hard or how soft the rock is. You measure the blow yield. Yeah, here we go. So just to go back to the description, you see you write down red brown soil, gravelly soil, then your brown gray sand with iron nodules. So there's transported soil. There's my pebble marker, and then here's where my dollarite started. But when this came out of the hole, it was just sand. But you can say it's dollarite, and you can infer it. Then you got coal. Coal comes out the hole just as like a black powder. It looks like um, the eye makeup that ladies use. I can't think of what it's called now. Mascara. It looks like mascara that just comes out of the hole. But you know that there's coal in the area, so you write down coal. You don't just write black powder. Do you, you understand what I mean when I say write down as much as possible? 
so that you make a useful yes. drill log. Okay. Yes, sir. Great. And then you can see there's my water strike on the contact between your shale and coal. You draw that in with just a blue line. Your blow yield is 0.2. There's no other um, water strikes in this hole. Then you measure your blow yield. I think this question came up last week. You either use a V-notch, which is this guy here. That's a 90 degree V-notch. So the drill rod is, or the drill hole is here. And then you got this channel that blows the, the water comes out the hole, goes down this channel and you measure the height going through the V-notch. And you calculate your yield from a table. Here's another V-notch. You know, they're just diverting the water around it while they install the V-notch. But then they'll close this channel off and the water will run straight through there. And they'll measure from that point straight up how much of a head you've got in the V-notch. Then bucket and pipe, very, very creative name. You make a dam around the head of the borehole. You put a pipe and then you dig a hole and you put a bucket in there. Then you blow it, the water fills up the dam and comes through the pipe. And then you stick your bucket in underneath the pipe and you measure how long it takes to fill the bucket. Because you know the volume of the bucket. It's either going to be a 25 or a 10 liter bucket. Okay, and then at the end of it, you measure the straightness of the ball. Yeah, that you usually do with a plumb line. Um, I'm not going to go into it that much because usually the drilling contractor does it for you. Um, it's like one of those old school techniques. But um, if your borehole is not straight, the problem is you're not going to get your casing in because your casing lengths are three meter lengths. So if you deviate even half a degree and you deviate half a degree for 100 meters, that becomes quite a, quite a turn and you're not going to get your casing done. You're just going to snap casing off. So you get the driller just to check the straightness of the borehole for you. I was reading just now at Northern, they just finished drilling a, a pilot borehole, a 1.5 kilometer pilot borehole with a deviation of less than 150 millimeters. I mean, that's on a 450 mil diameter borehole. Uh, that that's very impressive. I'll share it on LinkedIn because it's quite a cool picture where they daylighted into the the mining shaft. I'll just make a note of that. Yeah, so that's what you include in your borehole log. Are we all comfortable with what you do as your supervision, what your sort of duties are, and that kind of thing? Yep. So. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, the straightness of a borehole, how do you mm. measure that once you've got your casing in? Well, if you've got your casing in, then it's straight. Um, you know, then it's straight enough. It, it's when your casing doesn't go in the hole, that's where it's not straight. Okay, but I mean, further, if you're, deep, if you're drilling a an exploration hole, mm -hmm. um, then, then you often have such shallow casing past that point. Um, how would you test, say, a 200 meter hole or a 300 meter hole? Uh, okay, I can understand. So you've got your stabilizer casing in and then you want to check the, the sort of straightness of the rest of the hole. Yeah. Okay. Well, look, there's, there's two techniques that are, are commonly used. The first one is the plumb line where, um, yeah, how do you describe a plumb line? It's like a weight at the end of a string. And then you, you check how straight that string goes as you lower it down the hole. Otherwise you get a laser shot. Yeah, that's one that they use on the mineral exploration side where you've got a laser that shines all the way down the hole and you check if it reflects off the wall at any point. Yeah, because your exploration rods, they bend little by little and then you get directional yeah. drilling. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, and the, the plumb line, is that mm. accurate in artesian conditions? Artesian is difficult. Um, yeah, and also artesian, it's difficult to get the casing in because your water is sort of pushing the, the casing out of the hole as you're trying to lower it in. So that, that one, personally, I've never had to deal with it. But um, I do know the oaks, they usually just case off the top. They don't even um, construct it all the way down. Yeah, I don't know if you've uh, ever experienced it. No, I'm busy. Yeah, um, I've just had that problem um, mm. and left it unsolved in a cat hole. Um, yeah, <laughs> but thanks. Thanks, the laser method might be very yeah, it's just good to know. Yeah, that's with artesian holes. I mean, I know what they do in the Karoo where they hit them is they just put the stabilizer casing and then they put a pressure cap on top of it. Um, you know, then it, it sort of stabilizes because you're not going to get that fluctuation in water levels that'll collapse your borehole over time. And the hydrostatic pressure of the, the water strike will keep the borehole open. Yeah, that makes sense to you. Okay, we'll carry on. Any other questions about drilling supervision? No. Okay, then we'll go on to construction how you design and what your sort of considerations are for construction. The first step is your borehole log. Yeah, if you don't have a good borehole log or a good understanding of what happened during drilling, you're not gonna design the borehole effectively. You, you're just sort of taking a stab in the dark. And from your borehole log, it'll tell you the borehole depth, obviously your borehole diameter, your blow yield, the geology encountered, which will give you an indication of stability of the borehole and how much pressure the formation might put onto your casing, your water strike depth and your blow yield contribution per water strike, which you saw in your daily site diary. And then yeah, when, you, when I talk about borehole diameter and constructed diameter, Sometimes when you drill, you start off drilling six inch, but then you hit a big water strike and you need to drill it bigger. Yeah, the diameter of the ball doesn't increase the yield of the borehole. Yeah, it will maybe a little bit, but it won't take it from a one liter second borehole to a 10 liter second borehole. But your diameter of the ball directly influences the potential pump equipment that you can use in a borehole. Yeah, you are not going to fit a six inch pump in a four inch borehole. So you need to take that into account when you're doing your water strikes. If you see it's a strong borehole, get it reamed, drill it bigger so that you can construct it bigger. You can see there's a six inch borehole. That blow yield was one liter a second. And then this is an 18 inch borehole where the blow yield was 120 liters a second. Now this one, we needed to put in a 12 inch pump. So we needed to drill it 18 inch, construct it 16 inch, and then uh, install the 12 inch pump. Your drilling diameter should be at least two inches larger than the casing selected, is so that you have uh, one inch on either side of the casing. So if you drill eight inch, you can construct a maximum of six inch. You drill six inch, you can construct the maximum of four inch and so on. And without this annulus, we call this the annulus, the space between the casing and the, the borehole wall. Without the annulus, you're not gonna get your gravel pack in and you're not gonna get the sanitary seal in. They might just bridge or get stuck somewhere. So you'll get this backup of uh, gravel pack or sanitary seal materials. You can see here, you've got this annulus around the borehole. This one, we couldn't do gravel pack because they managed to drill it straight into the underground mine. 
um, but you still had to leave this annulus because eventually they put in a sanitary seal just to stop the surface contaminants going into the underground mine. Okay, and you're casing the material that you choose, whether it's steel or PVC, you select it based on the conditions at the site, which includes the pressure from the formation in the borehole. Is it a collapsing borehole or is it a stable borehole? And then the corrosion potential of the groundwater. Yeah, if you've got collapsing formation, your, um, you can't use a thin casing because it'll just collapse under the pressure. Same as if you've got corrosive acidic type water, you can't put steel casing because it'll just rust and then you're just going to get a collapsing borehole as well. This you get from um, regional data because obviously once you've drilled, you need to construct it when you're on site. So you need to have an idea of this before you go drilling. Uh, this you'll typically determine during the quotation phase what material casing you're going to use, PVC or steel. And the signs 10299 states that your steel casing should be at least a three millimeter wall thickness and a UPVC, the blue plastic casing, should be at least six millimeter wall thickness. This is not to say that it must be six all the time. Sometimes you go up to 12, 16, I think the biggest is like 18 or 20 mil um, for your sand formations. And your casing can either be threaded where you screw in the different um, lengths of casing or it can be a join on the PVC or welding on the steel. The advantages of your PVC is a resistance to corrosion. It's lightweight, so it's easier to transport. You, know, you can bring it on a bucky with a trailer or you, know, you don't need a special truck. Uh, it's easy to install because you can install it by hand to a certain depth. And then it's resistant to acidic cleanouts. The disadvantage is it's not as strong as steel. It's not as heat resistant. And then it's got lower compressive strength. And it's also flexible. So if it's not centered in the hole, if you get stuck on the wall of the hole and you push it down, it might snap the casing and then you've got to sort of abandon the hole and, um, and redrill. Because once your casing falls in the hole, you're either going to waste a few days fishing or you know, it's just going to get stuck in the way and you can never do anything past that depth. Steel casing advantages is that it's strong heat resistant and compressive strength is higher and it's a rigid pipe so if you do get a bit of collapsing in your ball you can just push it through you, know, you can hammer it a bit through without snapping anything the disadvantage is that it's got corrosion potential so it rusts over time if you've got corrosive water or acidic water It's heavier, so it's difficult to get to site. You need a truck typically. You know, if you're doing a thousand meter drilling campaign, you need to um, get a, <laughs> like a heavy duty truck. Uh, it's relatively higher in cost than the PVC. You know, PVC casing for a 125 mil, you're looking at about 300 rand a meter. For steel, you can look at anywhere from 400 up to 700 rand a meter. And then you also get a buildup of scale on your slotted steel casing. You know, your, your metal gives like a growth medium for biofouling and those kind of things. It's not to say that PVC doesn't get it. It's just more likely in steel casing because you've got more of a sort of pockmarked surface where the stuff can, can settle in and grow. And when we talk about well screens, the screen is also a slotted casing. So it's a piece of pipe or casing with slots in it. Um, yeah, and you place that to allow water to enter the ball efficiently, but protecting the ball from collapse or the ingress of any detritus, like your mud or sand or anything that's in the aquifer. You, you play a balancing act between making the ball strong enough not to collapse versus allowing water to get in efficiently. So typically we'll use a ratio of 60% solid to 40% slotted. 
So in a 100 meter borehole, you'll have 40 meters of slotted casing and 60 meters of solid. And your ball efficiency should ideally be about 70 to 80 percent, but typically most people get 50 to 60 percent. Just because the hole collapses and then your casing is uh, offset by two meters and you end up bridging one of your, your water strike zones or something like that. And that's again why your drilling supervision is important because you can see the driller stopped at 80 meters, not 82 or he stopped at 90 meters, but there was a bit of collapse. So you're going to design the casing to be 85 meters. Does that make sense to everybody? Because I know it's a complicated thing to get around. I'm going to say yes, it makes sense. Yes, uh, to me, it does. <laughs> Okay, great, Lizelle. So, Poncho, you've unmuted yourself. Does it make sense? Yeah, it does. Okay. Great. So, we'll carry on with gravel pack. So, the gravel pack, we put in the annulus between the casing and the wall of the borehole. This prevents the borehole from collapsing onto the screens, you know, which are your weakest point in the borehole but it also acts as a filter to restrict your fine particles from entering the borehole. And you know, it's like a mechanical filter, you know, these Brita filters you get on the infomercials and at uh, the very mark section of the shop. They've got this little gravel pack that you filter your water through. That's a similar concept to what you're doing to your borehole. Your gravel pack diameter should obviously be at least two to three times larger than the slot size. And it should retain about 70% or more of your aquifer material. Now this is your D70 on a particle distribution diagram, which we don't often get for a site. So you just use your, your sort of general knowledge of a sandstone. So a sandstone will have a typical grain size of X, then you make sure that your gravel pack will retain that. Typically we use two to three millimeter gravel pack and we make it a silica gravel pack because silica doesn't break down. Because if you put in a sandstone gravel pack over a couple of years because of the oxidation, etc., that gravel pack is going to start weathering itself. And then what's the point of your gravel pack if the gravel pack is generating fines? <laughs> you're kind of destroying the borehole from the inside out. And your gravel pack, you typically install to a maximum of two to five meters below the surface to give you space to install your sanitary seal. And then you install it gradually. So it'll come in bags typically. So you'll do one bag at a time and then you'll shake the, well, not you, the contractor will shake the pipes and make sure it goes all the way down to the bottom. And then you'll put another bag in and you'll shake it. And you'll do a rough calculation of how many bags you need. And you'll measure every 10th bag or 15th bag. You'll take a measurement and see where your gravel pack is and where it should be. And then the final step is a sanitary seal. Your sanitary seal just prevents the infiltration of any surface water or surface contaminants into the borehole. Typically, we do a two to five meter thick sanitary seal where there's no obvious surface contaminants. Two meters is fine. But if you're near a pit latrine or in a, near to a stormwater drain or something obvious that can contaminate it, you'll make it a bit thicker, sort of five meters. You make it with either a bentonite, which is a sanit uh, swelling clay, or a cement grout or slurry. You just mix a whole bunch of the drill chips with cement and you, you pour that down the hole to solidify. And the only picture I could find that really makes sense is with the pit latrine. And here, they don't use the gears with the, without the sanitary seal. 
And then here is where they've put the sanitary seal at the water strike zone. You can see the pit latrine stuff goes down into the aquifer, but it doesn't come into the borehole. It doesn't get to our screened off zone. Whereas if you just have a, an open borehole, all the bacteria comes and there's a party in your water, co water column. So, you know, and typically we'll put this on surface because your water level will be here somewhere. And then you just prevent your, your stuff going into the hole. So it does that. So let's start with Klingiwe. What's your question? Um, I'm, I just want to find out for the sanitary soil, is mm -hmm. it only for like solid material? Because I would assume if it's contaminants that are like with the water, they would obviously go in, right? Well, this is to, to protect you from your surface contaminants. Um, so your, your sort of surface sources of contaminant. If the groundwater is contaminated already, unfortunately, there's not much you can do about that except for pump and treat or expensive remediations. Um, so the sanitary seal is to prevent contamination or further contamination. So it doesn't matter what type of contaminant, because I, I don't understand how would water go in the like borehole, but other types of contaminants won't go in if they are like mixed with water, even if let's say they just, they are from the surface and they just go in. Let's say for example, chemicals from maybe in, um, a near industry place or whatever. And now it goes all the way down to the groundwater and wouldn't it go in the borehole? Well, think about your infiltration mechanism. You know, this is to prevent close bar sources. Um, so that like, if you look here at this picture, you've got the latrine sort of within 10, 20 meters of the borehole. Mm. So there, you know, like I said, this is not an ideal picture, but what would happen is you'll have your interflow, which will come into the borehole column there mm. with the, that'll be fast. But with your further away sources, like your industries and that, you'll get your uh, dispersion and advection mechanisms that dilute yeah. your contaminant. Mm. Um, and then that's, once those are in the groundwater, you know, then you're going to have to look at remediation type things or, so this is to protect your, your head zone of the borehole. So this is surface more than uh, big time sources like a tailings dam or an industrial dump or something like that. Yeah, I still don't get it. I'll Google it. <laughs> like, yeah, I still don't understand what difference it makes, though. If, let's say, it's, like, I still don't understand, like, what difference it makes if it's something that's right there, like, near the borehole, or if it's something from far. If, well, look, if it, the it, water is contaminated, yeah. Mm, look, it, it's preventing what you can because you cannot protect the borehole. The only way to protect the borehole from a big contaminant source is to not drill the borehole. Perfect. You know, it's, um, prevention is better than, <laughs> it's better than nothing, you know, with a sanitary seal. And I'll also research it a bit, and if I find anything that'll clarify it, um, I'll definitely put it up on LinkedIn or I'll pop you an email. Okay, thank you. Okay, sorry, it's confusing. Uh, I have a question. Yes, um, Antonio. Uh, if are there special consideration uh, in the order to construct an apiosometer, or is the same methodology to take an account of? Um, it, it's similar. Uh, with a piezometer, you'll need a bit more detailed information if you've got a dual aquifer system. You know, if you've got a shallow aquifer with a deeper aquifer, um, if you're putting in a vibrating wire piezometer, if you're doing a straightforward level piezometer. But um, in, in general, it's a similar concept to construction. Okay, thank you. 
Uh, Victor? Oh, yes, thanks. Sir. Uh, I just want to ask like the, when, when they're using the sanitary cell spe uh, specifically for clay, is there any like sort of special thing it does in, in terms of like trapping these contaminants? Look, you can put in a reactive um, clay if you want to, that'll sort of chelate or leach out your contaminants. I've never done it personally, but um, the, it acts as a physical barrier. You know, it just stops the flow. If your flow can't get to the borehole, then your contamination can't get to the borehole. Oh, okay. 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 Does that answer your question, Victor? Yeah, yeah, it does. Because, like, I just, uh, just wanted also to just to clarify, just to like get a clarification on what, like, like specifically, if they are using like a swelling clay, like, is it, is it because like some you know chemical properties of the clay that maybe just trap these contaminants from getting into our bowl? Yeah, you see, it doesn't trap the contaminant per se, it traps the water. Um, so the contaminant is in the water, which gets trapped in your swelling clay or your cement or whatever. It gets trapped inside there instead of going into the borehole. Oh, okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. And Neil, you've got a question. Uh, it's, it's more just like just some uh, in interesting information that we are currently using uh, droughting to uh, confine our confined aquifer from the top unconfined aquifer while we're doing a deep injection well in the confined aquifer. So we're grouting in between the aquifers to, um, to render any contact between the two bodies of water. Yes, now that's a, that's a good thing that you, you mentioned that, Neil. So what you're doing is you're sort of grouting off here so that only this tube or your rod is open and then you don't influence your shallow aquifer with anything you're doing in the deep aquifer. Yeah, that's correct. Oh, great. So, and what, what kind of grout are you using? Uh, it's a, I don't know specifically, it's mostly used in oil field explorational drilling. So mm. I'll have to look it up, but yeah, it's, it's commonly used in the oil fields. Yeah, that's like a, that's probably like a bentonite of some kind because it needs to set quickly so that you can carry on. You know, you don't have to wait a month for it to dry. Yeah, no, it's, it's quite rapidly. And then we use a uh, boreal geophysics to just ensure that the grouting sets throughout. Okay. No, very interesting. Thanks for, for sharing that. So any other questions on this section? No. Okay, we'll just go to the last one, which is borehole development. This is once you've constructed everything and once your borehole is installed. Your yeah, development procedures are varied and they include pumping the borehole, surging the borehole, jetting, or the addition of chemicals like a chlorine concentration to disinfect the borehole if you're using it for domestic use. And the basic purpose of the methods is to agitate the finer material around the well so that it can be carried into the well and pumped out. So you want to do this before you put your pump equipment in and you want to do it during development phase. So you can see here we've got our, our borehole and this is our gravel pack and this is sort of representative of the aquifer material. So at the beginning of development the whole gravel pack looked like this but then you do your air lifting or whatever method you're using and you, you blow out all the fines so that these don't come into your borehole at a later stage. Because once they're out, they're not gonna come back in generally because your gravel pack will sort of close it off. Antonio? Uh, I have a question. Uh, mm -hmm. 
what, what is the consideration about uh, increase the, the depth of the uh, borehole? So when would you increase the depth of a borehole? Yes. Um, now look, it depends if you haven't got the yield that you want, but there's regional information that suggests it's deeper. Um, or you want to increase the sump of your borehole. You know, so if your water strike is at 98 and you've drilled to 100, you would typically drill it to 105 or 110 meters just to increase that pressure gradient of your water strike, develop it a bit further. Uh, but it, it's tough. It's sort of site specific. There's no general rule that I know of that will tell you when to drill deeper. Oh, thank okay. you. Does anybody have anything to add to that question? You know, have you come across anything where you'd have to drill deeper or it gives you advice on when to drill deeper? Nobody. Yeah, so Antonio, it's, it's sort of site by site. You, you just have to look at your data. You need to look at what you've encountered during drilling and um, you make a judgment call from there based on the evidence that you have on hand. Uh, yes, I think it's necessary to run an uh, electric register or something or gamma gamma study, also your physical downhole for more information. Yeah, look, that'll, that'll give you information about your borehole. Um, the more information you have, the better your decision-making capacity becomes. So you, you'd never rule it out. It depends on how important the borehole is because downhole geophysics can be quite expensive. Okay, thank you. Okay, so with your, with your development, we typically use airlifting where the driller just lowers their rods down and they lift it for at least two hours. You know, sometimes it can go two to six hours depending on how much fines are coming out the borehole. And you keep blowing until your water becomes clear. You know, you'll have, um, some people have like a centrifugal funnel where they take the water out of the borehole when it's being blown out and you'll see how much fine set light at the bottom. Um, or you can just use, a, you catch it in a bucket and you see how much settles out. This is just to prevent any of these fines getting into your pump. Because if your pump gets material into it, then it burns, it clogs, and uh, you lose efficiency of your pump. So that's the main objective of our development. And this is an interesting method I came across when I was doing this presentation. I've never done it before. Uh, maybe one of you guys have, but this is something, uh, it's a surge block. So it works like a toilet plunger almost, you know, to develop it. So you force the plunger down and you push the water out of your slots and then you lift it up, which draws the water back in. So you're physically forcing water in and out of your slots to, to move it out. Uh, I thought it was quite interesting because I've never seen it before. You know, I've used the toilet plunger, but not, uh, not on a borehole scale. Yeah, you know, I can just imagine the energy that you need to, to push that water in and out of the borehole. But um, it, it works, it should work pretty well. And so that's just something interesting that I came across, or well, I found it interesting. So that, that is just a quick overview of drilling, drilling supervision, and how to design your construction. Um, I know, Kling, you are you, you're still waiting for the answer on the sanitary seal, and I'll do my best to get something to you. But. Uh, okay. <laughs> Are there any other questions? Yes, Poncho. Um, thank you. Um, maybe a bit of question, but um, you mentioned when you were mentioning 
um, the story at Tabazimbi, or is it Northam? Yeah, when you said they were daylighting, what exactly is it to daylight? Uh, um, it's when the drill rod sort of pokes through. Yeah, if you think about it, you take a hand drill and it's got a half meter long bit and you start drilling into a wall. When the bit comes out the other side of the wall, you call that daylighting. Oh, okay. Yeah, because before that, it was in the hole. You didn't see it. Nobody saw it until it popped out the other side. Mm -hmm. So it okay. came back into daylight or mine light. Oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, you'll see, I'll share that picture. I'll look for it on LinkedIn um, and I'll share it on the page. You'll see it. That's a really cool photograph. You see this bit poking out the top of the, the stope roof. Okay, thank you. Okay. Has anybody else got a question? Anybody else? Can you see? Want to oh, ask, um, is it a must to disinfect a borehole after construction? It's good practice, yeah, because um, you know that when your casing is lying out in the open, you do get the animals running across it and people touching it the whole time. So you get your E. coli and a bit of coliforms on it. Um, so it, it, it is good practice just to put a bit of chlorine in it and then blow it out. Yeah, because chlorine, if you use it in reasonable volumes, it won't cause too many quality issues with the borehole. Okay, thanks. Okay. And especially if you're using it for domestic supply where people are going to be drinking it and, you know, but do it during development so that when you put the dose in, you can blow it out again or pump it out depending on what uh, development method you're using. Anybody else got any questions on the drilling supervision and drilling design, etc.? Nothing. Okay, so then I think we're done with that one. Thanks, guys.